I do some consulting work on the American feeling in the room was You don't ever say to her that what about the Chicago incident? We left. We were trying to take back over. We're doing an autism. You may not recognize the name Alan Blanco, but you soon will. This young filmmaker and Penn State graduate is making a name for himself. His debut feature film, Mono Susius, with first-time director Joseph Vladica, is making the film festival rounds to critical acclaim. Blanco co-wrote and shot the film, which was executive produced by Spike Lee. The deeply affecting story is set and shot in a part of the world we rarely see on screen, the drug underworld of Buenaventura, Colombia. We'll talk with Blanco about what inspired Monosucius, about the crowdsourcing campaign that financed the film, and about what's next. Here's our conversation with Alan Blanco. Alan Blanco, welcome to the program. Well, thank you very much for having me. Your new film, which is stunning, uh, Mono Susius, is the story of two estranged brothers, both uh, Afro-Colombian from Bu other fishermen from Buenaventura, Colombia. Give us a synopsis of your film. Well, Buenaventura is the largest port city on the Pacific coast of Colombia and at times is the epicenter for a lot of the beginnings of the drug trade. And uh, it's a story of that these two estranged brothers who, through circumstances of economic circumstances, societal circumstances, are put on this job together where they're towing a torpedo full of cocaine uh, submerged under the water behind their fishing boat. And um, it's, it's one of the many different ways that cocaine kind of makes its way into the country. In and fact, according to the U.S. Coast Guard, 250 uh, tons of cocaine are transported exactly as you described in your film. Yeah, and, and it can range from fully submersible submarines to these torpedoes. To, it's just a lot of ways of, of sort of bringing the product into the country. And, and while there's been a lot of films with these sort of larger-than-life characters, um, like legendary films, by like, like like Scarface and, and things like that, it, within American cinema specifically too, this particular aspect of the drug trade is is not particularly well seen, and this particular part of Colombia, Buenaventura, uh, I believe hadn't really had a lot of attention given to it filmically, and that was something that I you know the production team, uh, the director Joseph Ladica uh, and myself were very passionate about trying to work with to bring light to. This was an ambitious undertaking, even for veteran filmmakers. So here are you and, and the director, you, Joe Vladica, you just mentioned, and a relatively small team going to a place. I want to describe what I read about Buenaventura, mm -hmm. Colombia. Uh, fear and desperation pervade the ramshackle communities. Life has become a litany of horrors in which mass graves, dismembered bodies, Torture and sexual abuse are commonplace. Uh, a community council leader said, not a day goes by in Buenaventura in which you don't hear machine gun fire. And, uh, and I, I do believe that that is very true. But one thing that my experience going there and meeting people in local communities are, there are very wondrous, spiritual, generous people that happen to live in an incredibly difficult environment, but it is still life, and life kind of takes its regular routines and stuff, and that's something that I know Joe and I wanted to make sure came across in the film was a sense of joy that they can have and the sense of friendships that they can form. Uh, uh, clearly a love of soccer, <laughs> that's very, very big there, um, but at meanwhile, this pervasive sort of environment in which, because of a global community, a global thirst for drugs, that, that can, can really exploit these people. Well, you get the sense that they're not perpetuating the drug trade. They're trapped in it. Yeah, I, I think that that's, that could be very true. And, and I, think, um, I think that as the story was beginning, um, this is this sort of the life of, of the film as it came to be was a lot of discovery. And so uh, the project initially was Joseph's um, before I had met him at film school. At and NYU? Yes, yeah, so at about uh, 2007 is when we met. So just before then, he had started sort of backpacking and just trying to garner more life experience before he was going to try to focus on his art artistic identity. And he had stumbled onto these stories, local fishermen, uh, speaking sometimes about the horrors you were talking about, but also about their spirituality and, and how they live off the water. And, uh, you know, 
they were kind enough and generous enough to allow him into their homes and into their lives and share their stories. And he knew that there was a story that he wanted to be able to tell. And it's, it was sort of fascinating that our outsiderness, I do believe, was useful in our film. Uh, in that we were these sort of gringos coming from like the, uh, the states that make a movie in their in their town. Gringos, but but Vladika said uh, that one of the things that the the community said about you was, uh, here's this Filipino filmmaker, yeah. here's this uh, Japanese Polish filmmaker, and and your producer is this. Uh, a uh, woman from Brazilian descent who speaks four languages. Yeah, and, and uh, our other, uh, you were speaking probably of Marcia Nunes and our other fantastic producer who's also... Elena uh, Greenleaves. Yes, as well, uh, with uh, an, an amazing history, a life history of her own from Russia to, and her connections to Brazil as well, and and also being very much a, uh, one of my favorite New Yorkers, even though she's currently living in San Francisco. But um, uh, we were a... Uh, cosmopolitan or, or like a polyglot kind of kind of crew in a way and we always knew that we wanted a sense of community we know that this was stories from this specific area that has a global reach because there's other parts of the world that can resonate with something so similar so there's this irony that you make a very specific story in this place that not many people see but but people in Southeast Asia, where my, my parents come from, and so they, also, they see the same sorts of things. Um, the way that people can be systemically displaced or economically forgotten. Um, and I think that that's one thing that was a joy in a weird way. That's a weird way to say, but working on this story with people in Buena Ventura. Really uh, I want to talk more about that because there's actually a very interesting story about this idea of giving back, that you weren't going to just go and tell their story but in, involve them in it. But before we do that, you were the director of photography, and so your job was to work with the director in, in providing or figuring out the, 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 um, the visual style that was appropriate for telling this particular story. Tell me a little bit about that, and then I want to share a, a short clip oh, that's part okay. of your trailer. Well, it's... Um it's interesting because the story of the film was his research and then we had gone through school together and then he had all this information and then we both worked on the script together. Uh, he was kind enough and, and entrusted in me enough that we could work on this, in this material together, which, I mean, it was very How do you, how do, you do that? Me. You know, two writers. I'm not sure how you do a screenplay that way. Uh, I, I think it's, it comes down to process, personal process, but we had always been collaborators. I, I had sound edited commercials that he had worked on and, and we kind of looked at edits together sometimes and we looked at each other's material um, and we, we found we, we spoke sort of a similar language. We, we would say like it's kind of like um, we kind of share the same religion about film. Like we, the things that we believe are true about the form are what we both like and there are many valid interpretations of art obviously but we happen to have similar ones and so that got us on the page together and on the page writing it was very much about how it was going to look and how we had to practically shoot it. So it became a natural progression to go from the page for when he would become the director, then I would become the director of photography. Because like, it, almost, it almost was just a visualization of the line writing, because we knew it was an unpredictable place with not a film infrastructure. It had to be shot a very specific way with a small crew. And we were able to maximize the ability to tell the story, to, get, to garner his fantastic performances from his actors. And I can't stress that enough. And I just didn't want to get in the way with the photography half the time. I just wanted to just let them let them just give their gifts to well, the film. So let, let's have a look. Dientes de Tio Guachupe. Porque ya está oscureciendo. Converte aquí con sus
again, that's just a, a sneak peek. I mean, it is a powerful movie. I, I, I'm kind of curious to know why you shot in this dangerous place and didn't use, as so many other filmmakers do, a stand in like Florida or Cuba to represent Buenaventura. Um, and there are certainly stronger infrastructures in a place like uh, Puerto Rico, for example. I think like they do like the Pirates of the Caribbean movies and things like that there. Um, I, we're actually lucky that in that um, that is our international teaser that was released for, I think, the Cartagena Film Festival and a couple other ones. Um, and we will be able to show uh, our American trailer sooner, later this month, or maybe next month, I'm not sure when. It, it's, a, it's sort of above my pay grade kind of thing. <laughs> um, but, uh, so, which is great. We have sort of more to show and more to, more to sort of elicit people's interest, I hope. Um, but speaking specifically about shooting there, it became more and more clear that we wanted the film to have, to be made responsibly and to be made hand in hand in a partnership with the people of Buenaventura. And that literally meant to be there hand in hand and to take their stories and move them to other places that maybe were more, co uh, not cooperative, but the more conducive to filming. It felt, it felt difficult. It, there's, there really is not many places, there's no other place in the world like Buenaventura. And the heft and the authenticity and, and the appeal of the film and what we, would make the, what we believe would actually make the film special was to go there, be guests, and garner a lot of the truth and a lot of the, the beauty that is there. The director, your director said there was no way you could have gone to Buenaventura and not included the community in this, and no way you could have made the film and just left. You had to give back. Yes. I explain what you did. Uh, well, um, throughout a, long, a lot of the process of Joe's research, he was already making sort of inroads and friendships and relationships there. But as a production, when we went closer to filming, and this is something I don't recommend most productions do just because of the time it takes, um, we developed a digital filmmaking workshop for them. Um, they're, these are many students there, and they're, they range from like mid-teens to sort of like early to mid-twenties. Um, there's such a thriving artistic community there of, of both modern music and sort of more traditional music, which, ends, which is actually in the film very Speaking often. Speaking of music, it's, the music yeah. in this film is spectacular. And, uh, and they have a theater program. Like most of the, uh, the cast is actually um, were theater students at a, at a university in Buenaventura. But this is their very first feature first time film. On, first time on film. They, they weren't used to camera. And that was something that we had to work with them a lot. Um, but so we knew that there was all these artistic identities, and then well, we had we had some craft uh, and some technique that we could show them, and, and to have them also like bring up their own stories. So over the course of about a month, um, once a week it was, uh, we would do our pre-production, and then we would go there, and the first one was script writing, and then we developed. And you'd shorts actually teaching and, them in, mm -hmm. this, in a workshop setting. And uh, then uh, then it was producing, and then we went out and shot it with cell phones, anything you can get your hands on that we, we thought was going to be possible for them to to replicate and move forward with and and um, and then from there ooh, there were some edits and then we were able they were able to kind of screen and enjoy their work and I I hope that you have continued in, in being their their own um, advocates with their own artistic voices you mentioned a moment ago the the, the two main actors in this who uh, this is their first feature film and they were just so believable so spectacular in their performance. There are two scenes in particular that, that blew me away. One is Hokobo uh, crying over the, the earlier death of his son. Mm -hmm. And then another where Delio is with his bare hands killing a thief. What was it like for you to shoot those two scenes? Oh, I mean, um, so much about the way the production was made and garnered around was knowing that the their performance would be the linchpin or the backbone of the entire film um, and both of their journeys. Uh, one person who sort of, I mean, with Hokobo, it's a person who is a bit, has been mired in the trade, is closed off, but by re-encountering an estranged brother, begins to let his guard down again, reconnect to feelings that he he had kind of, not compartmentalized, but sort of had numbed himself to and then he ends up sort of breaking down some of these walls because he's been in touch with another person who can, who loves him and can love him and he can love as well 
um, which has ramifications and consequences in the film afterwards of what happens when you take the, those walls down, and that scene is indicative of it. And and that scene, I mean, the performance that Charlie gives mm. is something. And it, it was, it's an, it's, it, I can't say it other than this. It's like it's an honor to be in the in, in the room or in the boat or whatever, and just to be able to photograph something like that. Well, well, speaking of in the boat, so here you are, uh, not only in this dangerous place in the world, but you're shooting a lot of this at sea in the Pacific Ocean. And I think yeah. of someone like John Huston, who shot much of Moby Dick at sea, and he said it was one of the most difficult films he'd ever made. Uh, it's a, certainly um, an unpredictable environment. Um, you got stranded once, I understand. Um, sort of more than once. Um, it depends on how much stranded you want to talk about it, but we, we sort of, the tide would go out and we wouldn't be done shooting and then we would have to kind of slog through the mud to try to get back to water with our gear and stuff like that. But um, uh, shooting on the water was difficult. It was sort of trying to eliminate any artifice that would prevent the performances from feeling real, I think. And, and being out there on the water, feeling, just looking out and seeing the vista of, of, of emptiness where anything can come at any time. And, and, and that was something that I, mean, I think it really seeps into everything. It certainly seeps into the camera movement, which uh, I'm glad not everybody gets seasick on the crew or anything like that. But and obviously you didn't. I did not, and Joe did not. Um, certain other people might have gotten slightly ill, um, but it was, it was all part of the physical experience of making the film. We saw a little clip of another scene that I particularly loved, and that is uh, the two brothers have kidnapped uh, the, the somebody, and they're, they're on uh, these makeshift rail cars. It's a motorcycle attached to what almost looks to me like a picnic table, and they are yeah. they are speeding down this uh, this uh, rail, uh, and and I'm looking at thinking. Wow, the, the ingenuity and the make-do um, attitude that must have created such a contraption. And then I'm thinking, here you are out in the Colombian jungle with a crew and, and no uh, film shop down the street in case something breaks. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, we were, uh, Canon, uh, Canon film, uh, Canon cameras were gracious enough to donate us. Uh, well, we, we want a grant that would, they were going to loan us uh, camera bodies and lenses for us to use. Uh, we actually, they were kind enough when we asked to have two bodies because we knew it was possible that one might malfunction because of the humidity or, or just things like that. Um, but so there was a lot of care and a lot of attention and I had um, Nick Wynn and Josh Flanagan were my camera team um, and they took care of me. They made sure I was safe. Uh, Josh is sort of like a very strong person. I think he might have held me by one arm when I was about to fall off of something, either a boat or a, or a they're called brujitas, which just means little witches, but yeah, he, he, he saved me a few times, I'm sure. Um, so it was, it was a lot of just looking out for each other and, and things like that. And, and knowing that we didn't have the ability to go to a film shop and do those things. So, so just going with our bare essentials and that we knew we needed to, to get the movie done. I mean, you, if you tried going in there with like a, a, a jib or a crane or, or something, it. It just, it's just, there's not enough manpower. And if anything goes wrong, it's just, it was, we need to be low profile enough, uh, almost documentary style, but, but we do like to say that we still had a, a good, strong narrative aesthetic to it that we still tried. You mentioned documentary, but this was never going to be a documentary for either one of you. What do you think you could do with fiction that you couldn't have done had you approached this story as a documentary? It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question um, because so much about where the, fict the fictitious story of these two people came from were tales and stories that we had heard from friends and families and I think fictionalizing it and dramatizing it um, so that it becomes these, not archetypical, but these journeys of ignorance to knowledge for these characters where you have a naive young kid who thinks one thing about the drug trade and then ends in a different place and you have a hardened brother who by reconnecting ends in another place. There's an emotional connection and uh, certainly nonfiction films can elicit strong emotional connections. Um, but the way that we wanted to move the audience um, was something that had to be done dramatically. And I think that it would also was a way and I, I, that I do believe 
we really wanted to make a movie that the people we were making the movie with would also enjoy. And there, there had and did been, they? Uh, I, think, I think pretty much um, overwhelmingly. And obviously it's a very difficult subject matter and it's very, very sensitive and personal to them. And they are, there are many different feelings that it can bring in a person. Um, what we hope is that the film is a part of a conversation. It's certainly not um, a mission statement or anything like that. We watched your characters change. You, you mentioned how Hakobo, the older brother, you know, changed when he had a, his estranged brother reconnecting with him. And, and Delio is this happy-go-lucky. He wants to, to climb the ladder of the, of the drug uh, lords. Um, uh, how did this film change the two of you? You and, oh, you and Joe. And oh, wow. Uh, it's um, uh, uh, one of uh, Joe and I's favorite film professors is Jose Angel Santana, um, who still teaches in New York uh, at Columbia and I believe SVA. But uh, he just casually remarked to me once, uh, I think we were just having coffee or something, and he just says, He's like, you realize the both of you are in that boat, right? And I was like, I understand. He's like, well, like what they're doing. I mean, it's not the same thing, but like you guys are kind of doing the same thing. I mean, it, it's um, Joe's debut feature, my, my first feature as well, um, the first feature of of Marcy and Elena. It certainly was a physical journey, an emotional journey that it it was from the inception of the film to to now when it's just on the brink of being distributed, and. Joe and I, we laugh, we fight. There's some scenes that are taken sort of out of our own sort of behavior. Um, and I think it was a journey that we were, we we're definitely different people after making the film. And to a large extent, that is a, an experience and a success that it can't be measured in whether or not enough people go watch it or right. if it makes any money or anything like that. Um, anyway. You mentioned NYU. You actually got your start in film school at Penn State. Yes. And there are some people who sort of scoff at, you know, an academic training in filmmaking. Obviously, you you and Joe yeah. didn't feel that way. Well, I, I liked it so much I did it twice. <laughs> but, um, so, so undergraduate and then graduate school. Yeah, and to be honest, my, the very beginning of my understanding of film as an art form as well as an, as an entertainment medium was here at Penn State. And... Uh, my first ever film professor was Chuck Unger, and we sat down and we just talked and we became fast friends. And you know, I didn't know Peck and Paw from John Ford for anything I, and until sort of those classes. And you know, I, I had obviously everybody has like this like experience they have as children and, and discovering the medium. I think the first movie I ever saw in the theater was like Back to the Future, and that's all I ever wanted to have happen. I, I'm still waiting for my hoverboard, by the way. <laughs> but um, but just that expansion of what. It, what film co is and can be, and, and what your part of it can be, if you if you allow yourself and dedicate yourself to it, um, I certainly appreciate it. Now, you know, people take very different artistic journeys, and I could never invalidate one journey over another, regardless of but the success. But this one worked for you. Um, but yeah, this one worked for me. I liked being in environments with similarly minded people, but very disparate personalities. Um, strong personalities. I didn't agree with a lot of people, and they don't always agree with me. And that's part of where, whatever that conflict is, is part where you kind of can grow as an artist. And and going into that environment, I mean, and going back again for uh, my masters, it was like just being able to dedicate more or less three years of my life to something I'm passionate about, surrounded by other passionate people, and tutored with world-renowned. Um, experts in the field. I mean, regardless of what you want to do, even if it's not art or whatever, it's, that's a rare place you can be. Speaking of experts in the field, not only was this film executive produced by Spike Lee, but he was your teacher and mentor at, at NYU. Yeah. Uh, he's, he believed in this project. He's a, such a, he's such a gracious man. He teaches in the third year, um, and he's the artistic director of, of, NY, of the NYU film grad program. And you know, he he very much gives not only his time, but he was able to supply some grants to various thesis films. Uh, this film actually ended up being Joe's thesis film, so the grant was enough to continue the the investigation and the research for Joe, and he can go back there and by garnering this information and photographs and stories and video. Even when we went to try to find 
uh, investment money or try to find financing. We had a we had a, a wealth crowdsourcing is part yeah. of how you was it family members you know you, your late mother was a physician your father was a businessman and I'm I'm wondering how they felt about you even pursuing uh, uh, you know a profession in in filmmaking which which can be a very risky thing to do and and so I I'm kind of curious to know about their support of your endeavors and then public support for mm -hmm. making getting this movie made. Well, the public support was probably best uh, person, uh, exemplified with uh, we did a Kickstarter, which we raised about sixty thousand um, dollars, as a large portion of our production budget came from that, and um, and it was friends and family and people who might have stumbled over the project. So even as I said, it's, it's always been a very communal um, sort of project and between the people with the partnership with the people of Ventura to our friends and our family who had known that we were sort of these like um, almost eccentric filmmakers, you know, <laughs> or whatever we are, we're crazy. Um, but believing it enough to donate what, whatever they could to the, to the project to have it come true. Thank you, Alan Blanco, so much for talking with us. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Alan Blanco. For more information about Manos Sucias and for additional footage from this interview, visit our website at conversations.psu.edu. I'm Patty Satalia. We hope you'll join us for our next Conversation from Penn State. Production funding provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Thank you. This has been a production of WPSU.